Thank you all for joining us this afternoon in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium for our book conversation, as it has already begun. Uh, we welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. I uh, would ask everyone here in-house if you'll make sure your cell phones have been turned off. It will be appreciated. Does that mean Catherine also? That means Catherine too, especially, and off, not vibrate, or we'll constantly get bzzz every time you get one of your tweets. Somebody else does. <laughs> My job is done. Hosting our discussion this afternoon is Genevieve Wood, who is Vice President for Marketing here at Heritage. She leads our creative team responsible for marketing research, product development, mm -hmm. video production, graphic design, advertising, and branding, all geared to educating government official and everyday citizens alike on Heritage's policy prescriptions. Before joining us in 2006, Ms. Wood worked for more than 14 years in Washington politics, policy, and media, having held media-related positions for such organizations and companies as the Family Research Council, the Leadership Institute, National Public Radio's Los Angeles affiliate, KCRW, NBC News in New York, and the Republican National Committee here in Washington. She also had her own media training and video production company, W Media. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, <clears throat> Genevieve Wood. Genevieve. John, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I have to say about Catherine Lopez, she's one of the most prolific tweeters uh, that I know, uh, regularly getting constant updates from her, but we'll, uh, we'll try to hold the fort down for you, Catherine, while thank you're you. doing the interview this morning. Uh, it's a privilege for me to welcome you all here and really to welcome both Lee Edwards and Catherine Lopez. Uh, I've had the chance to work with Lee on his book, leading the way in terms of not writing it for him, but helping him promote it. And for those of you who have ever been a part of book events, uh, you should know it is rare when many times people come up and they endorse a book that they've actually read the book. <laughs> I've read this book, read it a long time ago, and I can tell you it's a great read. Uh, anyone who has been a part of the conservative movement, who's worked in the conservative movement, when you read this book, you really feel like you've been there over the past 40 plus years. And that really goes to the great talent uh, that Lee Edwards brings to this project and so many others he's been a part of. Uh, Lee, as many of you know, is a leading historian of the conservative movement. Uh, and this is not his first biographical work. Uh, he's also produced biographies of William F. Buckley, uh, of Barry Goldwater, and of Ronald Reagan. So it's not surprising that he brought his great uh, intelligence and his writing skills to writing the history of both the Heritage Foundation and our longtime president, Ed Fulner, who just stepped down uh, this past <coughs> week. Lee's an adjunct professor at Catholic University, and it's interesting that Catherine Lopez, who is now a former uh, student of Lee Edwards at Catholic University, will be interviewing the professor, so that will be a nice turn oh, of events today. Oh, going to get back at me. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, as many of you know, is the editor-at-large of National Review Online. Uh, she's, you've seen her work in many places beyond NRO, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post. Uh, you've also seen her on Fox News Channel, CNN, C-SPAN, and many other places as well, and we're delighted that she's here today to first do an interview with Lee about the book, and then also to take your questions as well. So with that, Catherine, I'm going to hand it over to you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, actually, speaking of Twitter, so this morning, that, that's where I get my news now. Um, and of course, the news came in uh, this morning that Margaret Thatcher had died. So that seems like an obvious place to start for obvious reasons. One person uh, I noticed on, on my Twitter feed said, I, I, I sort of think the love for Mar Margaret Thatcher is going to come from Americans on the right, mm -hmm. or, or Americans in general, mm -hmm. even more than in Britain. Why, why was she so important to conservatism in America? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, um, because there is such, uh, there is a, a reverence that se seems on only secondary to the reverence for Ronald Reagan. And there's something real there, and, um, and particularly in the context of, of heritage. What's her history with heritage? Well, Catherine, in, in several ways, uh, Lady Thatcher, uh, Margaret Thatcher, was, uh, someone who liked us so much that when she decided to set up an institute in her name that she came to Heritage and said, I wanted to be here. She could have gone anywhere in the world, at least in what used to be the British Commonwealth, and, uh, and established it there, but she established it here. That has to be a little controversial. Right. right. <laughs> and she felt that her ideas, her ideas for freedom and against tyranny would be preserved here and would be promoted here, uh, would be disseminated here, 
So she always felt very, very comfortable. As a matter of fact, <coughs> Niall Gardner, who heads up the Margaret Thatcher Center here at the, at the Heritage Foundation, uh, met with her just last December. And the first question uh, which she asked him was, how is Heritage doing? How is Heritage doing? And also, uh, Lady Thatcher loved America. And she felt really that, that the West, the Western civilization, uh, really the future, uh, you might even, might even say of, of the world, certainly of the free world, depended upon American leadership. Mm -hmm. And she always looked to, to us, heavy burden for us, to do exactly that. She was very close also to Ronald Reagan. Uh, and uh, when they first met, she had just become uh, prime minister, or head of, actually head of the Conservative Party, and he had not yet declared himself to be a candidate for president. They met for the first time over in London, and at the end of that conversation, she said, we must work together. We that must work together, and they did that. And finally, uh, Margaret Thatcher gave one of the very first uh, lectures of our series here, of the Claire Booth Luce lectures. And in the course of that lecture, she said, one of the, I gave one of, the, one of the most memorable lines in talking about the contribution of, of Ronald Reagan. She said, he won the Cold War without firing a shot. And what a wonderful summing up of one of the, just one of the things which uh, Ronald Reagan did uh, for, for the West and for the world. And there, there's a, a lot of, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to the book specifically in a moment, but there's, a, there's been a lot of, a, there's a symbiotic relationship between conservatives here and conservatives in Britain. You know, even, even on, on is, issues of welfare policy, I mean, getting beyond the, the, the Cold War that's happening even today, and, and Jennifer, or Jennifer Marshall's been working with people and, um, many, on many levels here at Heritage. Why, why does that relationship, it, it is that special relationship we hear people talking about, isn't it? Well, I think there's, there's a, shared values. I, I, I think there's just a great example. You know, if you look at the conservative movement today, uh, a, few, a few conservatives are depressed. <laughs> and they're still trying to figure out what happened, why are we here with uh, President uh, Obama, what about Obamacare, right. uh, it, are, is America over? Is it all over? You know, is this all there is and we just got to adjust ourselves uh, to, to the uh, welfare state? And I think if we go back and look at Margaret Thatcher and look at Great Britain in the winter of 1978, she came in office in 1979, 1978, Britain was the sick man of Europe. Things were so bad at that point under the Labour government. Things were so dysfunctional that dead bodies were not being buried. Garbage was piling up in the streets. Strikes were mounting all over Britain. And the British people said, we're not going to keep going this way. And they voted out Labour, brought in Margaret Thatcher, the first woman prime minister. And what did she do? She turned Britain around. And believe me, Britain was far, far, farther down the road to serfdom than we are today here in America. So the message to conservatives, it seems to be, Catherine, is it can be done. Things can be turned around with the right leadership and with the right ideas. And that's what Margaret Thatcher, I think, sets for us. It's this great example. I mean, she sold off uh, uh, government-owned subsidy, uh, government-owned uh, corporations like uh, British Telecom and British Steel. Uh, she reduced federal spending in Britain. She cut taxes in Britain. It can be done. It was done. And I think that's a, a tremendous example for us here at this point before conservatives. So one issue that, that you write a bit about in the book and, and has been such a core part of what Heritage has been doing recently is the health care issue. And, and we are where we are in the second Obama administration, obviously. Why, um, you talk about Ed Fulner being ever optimistic in the book. Um, why, as he's leaving as, as president of Heritage, does not, he not feel like a total failure, you know, <laughs> on one level, um, when we are where we are? And how, how, um, how, how do you, does Heritage uh, represent this, this idea that, that, that something different can be, happen even after what will be two terms of, uh, of President Obama? What I try to do in, in leading the way is to show uh, what leadership is all about, and it's called leading the way. And that's what Ed Fulner uh, was for 36 years as the president, and that's what the Heritage Foundation has been. 
and building up the conservative movement. Let's flip it around. Let's say, supposing there had been no, in terms of what difference does it make? Flip it around. There, had been, there, there was no heritage. Think about that for a second. There was no Ed Fulner. Well, let's see now. If that's the case, what, what would we have or not have? Well, uh, might not have had <laughs> SDI. Because before there was SDI, there was High Frontier which was a study which Heritage Foundation uh, underwrote uh, General Daniel Graham, former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency at the Defense Department, set forth in this study in 1982, which is before SDI, a missile defense system. And we know that that had a tremendous impact on the Reagan administration, and particularly on the science advisor, George Keyworth, who said afterwards it was because of High Frontier, Danny Graham, Ed Teller, and other people as well, that he finally endorsed SDI. And that would have been a big obstacle to moving ahead with SDI. What difference did SDI make? Well, very possibly, we would still be fighting the Cold War. Because SDI convinced the Soviets they could not win an arms race with the United States, forced Mikhail Gorbachev to come to the bargaining table and made sure, as Margaret Thatcher said, that the Cold War ended without firing a shot. Is this why you write books like this? Because that's not <laughs> necessarily the conventional view of history, right? Well, of course it isn't. Uh, and, or take another example. Um, how successful would Ronald Reagan have been in his, his eight years? Well, it so happened that he was given, uh, just after he was elected, a little study called Mandate for Leadership. Mandate for Leadership. Policy for a Conservative Administration, in which the Heritage Foundation, bringing together 250 experts, who, by the way, served for a full year without getting one penny, one dime. We didn't pay them anything. All we gave them was pizza and Coors beer. Um, and that did add up a little bit over the weeks, but that's another matter. Uh, we produced Freedom was worth it. Right. <laughs> uh, we produced Mandate for Leadership before Reagan was nominated, let alone elected. I mean, that's, we felt so convinced that we had to bring together and these people, these experts, and to come up with recommendations, 2,000 recommendations in this book, Mandate for Leadership. Well, did Ronald Reagan like it? Well, I guess he must have, because he took mandate for leadership and put copies of it on the seat of every member of his cabinet at their first meeting. So when they sat down, oh, what is this? And there was mandate for leadership. And President Reagan said, gentlemen and ladies, this is something I like very much. Here is an agenda for you when you go ahead and try to figure out what your department should do. So what difference does one man make? What difference does one institution make? It makes an enormous difference if it is the right institution with the right ideas. Which, by the way, uh, Ed Fulner talks about, if you want to know about how do you make things happen, uh, Ed Fulner says three I's. Ideas, individuals, and institutions. You need the right ideas. Limited government individual freedom and responsibility, traditional American values, strong national defense, the free enterprise. Those are the five basic ideas of the Heritage Foundation and the conservative movement. And I would argue the American founding. You need individuals who will take those ideas and begin implementing. Third, you need an institution, you need an infrastructure, so that they can take those ideas and disseminate them out, get behind them, and make them work, and apply them to the policy questions of the day, which is what Heritage has been doing for 40 years. And that's why I think the book is an important book. It's, uh, I, I hope, in part because I, I think tanks aren't the novelty that they were when, when Ed started out and when Heritage started out. I, I, I fear people won't realize how, how important this is. Um, the, uh, how, how, how can ha the lessons of, of, of the Heritage Foundation and, and what Ed did um, help Help the leaders of tomorrow. You know, we, we focus so much on the celebrity, you know, the personality. 
But as you say, Ronald Reagan wasn't Ronald Reagan without friendship with Bill Buckley and, uh, and, and, and an institution with ideas and, and personnel as policy comes up once or twice in right, the book. Right, um, you, right. you can have a fabulous leader, but if he doesn't have the people in his cabinet who are going to make it happen and who, who know how Washington works and knows what's right and what's wrong, um, you're not, you're not going to make it happen. How is this a, pract a practical guide for people? Well, I think what, what, I, what I try to do in leading the way is to not only tell the story of Ed Fulner and making heritage a permanent Washington institution. And that was his goal when he started out in, in 1977. So he didn't sell out by becoming establishment. He's uh, No, he's very actually, much so. And was trying, trying to create uh, part of a, a counter-establishment, really. So that was one goal of his, was to create a permanent Washington institution based on conservative ideas. But the second thing was that he wanted to help build, help shape, help mold a conservative movement. Again, he knew that a strong heritage and a weak conservative movement served neither party. Right. What you needed was a strong heritage and a strong conservative movement. And one of the first things that Ed Fuller d uh, did when he came in was to start the Resource Bank. Brought in a wonderful uh, organizer, Willa Johnson, who was the first person to take that responsibility on. When it started, bringing together think tanks and think tank leaders and NGOs and so forth from across the country, there were about maybe 10 or 15 who really met at that first meeting. Last year, uh, there were some 600 people and about 250 uh, CEOs of various organizations. And I see Bridget out there in the audience. And Bridget, I, I suspect that the number is going to be even higher uh, this year. And because people are coming not only from this, from here, from America, but from around the world, 30 or 40 nations, which are represented now at the Resource Bank. So Ed Fulner, this young man from the south side of Chicago, had a dream. The dream was a permanent institution, a strong conservative movement, but beyond that, having an influence around the world. Now, was that just something that happened automatically? Or was it because it was built upon the right ideas? And frankly, because he had the experience already in working with think tanks and also had a sense that America had to be a part of the world and had to be a leader of the world, going back to what Margaret Thatcher said about looking to American leadership. So in so many ways, I think uh, Ed Fulner uh, reflects the, the philosophy of uh, Margaret Thatcher, of Ronald Reagan, and also, I think, of, of all right-thinking conservatives, including uh, Bill Buckley. The part of the resource bank and, and heritage in general, um, one, one important theme has always been, you talk about in the book, fusionism. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Buckley was, w w was all right. about that at right. National Review. Yeah. I, I oftentimes, in part because of just the times we live in, I, I, I fear that conservatives are more about you know, outing the, 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 having purity tests and outing the, the person right. who, who doesn't right. fit it. Um, there is room for different voices, but there's also a, a mainstream view that we want to, um, th th there is a right way um, on, on, on many things, right, in, in the terms of, of uh, in, in, in both sense of the, the term, we believe, right? Um, so uh, so how does he, how, w w what mm. lessons can he give us in, uh, in how to navigate that? Maybe also learning from mistakes along the way. The, there are many uh, Fulner laws. And uh, so one of his favorites is that politics is, is addition and not subtraction. And politics is multiplication and not division. And so what he, as the leader of Heritage, and what he has always said to his colleagues is, let's work together where we possibly can. Let's come together. Let's cooperate. Let's seek areas of agreement and not disagreement. He's always talked about heritage being an honest broker of varying uh, points of view about a particular issue, about being a big tent as possible and bringing people in. And within that tent, of course, you can have all kinds of acts going on all sorts of entertainments being presented, 
all sorts of maybe I want to go first or I want to go this and so forth. You have that inevitably. But if somebody is There's saying, a lot of humanity in that tent. <laughs> right, there is that. But I think in the sense of if you have somebody setting that kind of an example, and Ed Fulner was just absolutely brilliant at that, of um, uh, being patient with people who perhaps were saying, it must go this way, it must go this way. And somebody else, Catherine, whom he would quote uh, frequently, would be Ronald Reagan. Now, Ronald Reagan, you know, I think we're all agreed, was, was a great, great conservative president, the greatest of, uh, of the 20th century, even more so than Calvin Coolidge. I know there are some people that might put Cal first, but I'm going to put Reagan first. Uh, and what did, what did Ronald Reagan say? He said, well, I will take 70% of what I want if I can come back for the other 30% later. And that's precisely what he did with the Economic Tax Recovery Act of 1981. He wanted 30%, which, by the way, was one of the recommendations of mandate for leadership. Again, the influence of mandate. He said, I want 30% across the board tax cuts. He didn't get it. He only got 25%. But nobody had ever talked before for 20 or 30 years in terms of an across the board 25% tax cut. So he was happy with that. But what did he do? He came back in 1986 with some other tax reforms, which gave him, if not 100%, another 10 or 15%. So he was way, way, way up in bringing about an economic recovery. And that's the kind of, I guess you might say, practical approach to politics and to public policy that Ed Fulner epitomized and which the Heritage uh, Foundation uh, lives by and works by. An important part of um, getting, getting different, different people with different approaches to, to, to work together, um, an essential part of that is actually knowing what you believe. Um, how much of, uh, how important from the, from the top has been educating <clears throat> Americans, mm -hmm. in addition to policymakers, not right. that policymakers aren't Americans, right. but but yeah. <laughs> the heritage members and students. I mean, mm -hmm. it's always struck me that the intern program is about not just free labor, but really mentoring people. And it, it has, was that always part of the vision? It was. It, again, <clears throat> in talking about uh, the resource bank and building the conservative movement, but also from the very beginning, the importance of reaching out to young people. And we have had an internship program here at the Heritage Foundation for many, many, many years and to the present time that we have about 75 interns who come in here during the summertime and another 50 or so who come in in the uh, spring and in the fall. So over almost 200 young conservatives now come here and uh, we encourage them to read, uh, we encourage them to explore, we encourage them to debate what they believe in. And uh, we know that it's made a difference. I mean, those people, among those who have graduated from here, Steve Moore of the Wall Street Journal is a graduate of, uh, of the Heritage Foundation. Dinesh D'Souza is a graduate, so to speak, of the Heritage Foundation. Chris Long, the president uh, of ISI, is a graduate and an intern here. And Rich Lowry, right. your boss, Catherine uh, Lopez. <laughs> Catherine Lopez. <laughs> yeah, right. no, if you if you right. if you go back, the number of uh, mm -hmm. if if you look <clears> at the, the sort of le leadership uh, uh, in in their forties <clears throat> and and whatnot today, they they either went through Heritage or National Review in yeah. a lot of cases. <clears throat> well, as a matter of fact, uh, I think it was uh, Steve Moore who said it really should be called uh, Heritage University <laughs> right. uh, because there were so many conservatives who have graduated here from from the Heritage Foundation, but always at the, at the center of that are the right ideas. And what I try to tell in leading the way is what was the, the intellectual foundation of, uh, of Ed Fulner. Among the early books that he read, Road to Serfdom uh, by Friedrich Hayek, um, The Conservative Mind uh, by Russell Kirk, and a, a more political book, but still philosophical in its way, uh, was uh, and is uh, The Conscience of a Conservative by Barry Goldwater. So, Ed Fulner, understanding the, the, the value, the power, the absolute necessity for the right ideas, has always stressed that and what he has said and what he's tried to impart and to use as a, as a philosophical foundation for the public policy decisions of heritage. You um, are one of the few biographers of Bill Buckley who mm. I think got to his core. 
and you talk a bit in the book about uh, about the fact that uh, that Ed Fulner wasn't just raised Catholic. This mm -hmm. it was uh, part of who he was and well integrated in his intellectual life mm -hmm. as well. Is that the cause of his optimism? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's part of it. I think he's just naturally congenitally uh, optimistic. He calls himself a perpetual eternal optimist. I think a lot of that comes from his faith, uh, a belief in God, that, that God has a plan uh, for him, for all of us, for the nation, and that uh, if we do the best that we can, and fight the good fight, keep the faith, that things will turn out in the best, in the best possible way. But, but he's not, not Pollyannish. Uh, he understands that linked up with even the best of ideas, you must have a way to implement those. You must have a way to disseminate those. And that was the, the, the genius. Uh, <laughs> in 1972-73, when Heritage got started, all of these, there were think tanks here in Washington, D.C., some very good ones, and even a sort of a right of center one like AEI. So what, why, why should you have another think tank? Well, he and Paul Weirich had this simple idea, but yet a brilliant idea, which was that we should produce, they said, research which is concise, reliable, and timely. As a matter of fact, they said, we don't want big, fat books being produced that take a year to write, and maybe even a year to read, uh, <laughs> but we want a research that can meet the briefcase test. What's that? Well, it must be a study that you can put in your briefcase, has to fit in the briefcase, and it has to be read, hopefully, in less than an hour, maybe even a half hour. And they knew that if they were able to produce that kind of research, that members of Congress, and maybe more importantly, their staffers, would read it. Simple idea. No other think tank was doing it. And when I went back and began interviewing other think tank presidents about the impact of heritage, they said, well, Heritage changed the think tank culture. We now do the same thing that Heritage did at the beginning. We now all do brief reports. We now all disseminate them and market them and promote them and sell them. This is what the Brookings, head of Brookings said to me. This is what the head of AEI said to me. So Heritage changed the think tank culture beyond doubt. The other thing is Heritage continues to, doesn't it? What, what accounts for the fact that my, my sense uh, over, over the last couple of years watching <laughs> is there, there's a real openness to adapting and mm. making sure that that, that, that responsiveness mm. and that timeliness right. is, is communicated in the right way for the times. Right. So there are not just, there's not just the study, but it's being tweeted, and there's right. some video yeah. that people yeah. are thinking, how do we go viral with this? And I imagine there, there, there's got to be a percentage of the building that has no idea what they're talking <laughs> about, but trusts <laughs> that it must be the right yeah. thing, yeah. Um, or that it will help. Yeah. Um, right. what, what accounts for that? Well, uh, again, I think it goes back to, to Ed Fulner, just uh, is no Luddite. Uh, he loves the latest uh, technology, and he's always got a gimmick. He's always figuring out this, what is this, and can I use this somehow, whether it's an iPad or an iPhone, or, and he tweets, uh, believe me he does, and Facebook, he was very much one of the first on Facebook, now of course, we're now beyond Facebook, aren't we, we're now, we're now tweeting all over the place. Uh, and so he's always made sure that Heritage was at the cutting edge of technology. Example of that, Town Hall. Town Hall uh, was a small little operation being run by National Review. Then it began slipping and sliding and maybe was gonna be phased out. Heritage got involved. We took command of it, built it up, and then we decided this is something that Heritage, we've done our, we've done our duty with this, handed it off, and it's now what? The, the largest, uh, one of the most important blogs and websites in, in conservative uh, uh, technology and Long promotion really communications. Really became one of the, the, the a great aid to the Tea Party because you had people right, just just right. posting their, their their opinions and getting their right. their uh, their stuff up uh, immediately. It and is let, let me say too, Catherine, that that is one reason why we're so excited about Jim DeMint as our new president because he is a high technology guy. I mean, he loves it. It's been part of it when he was a businessman. He loves mar the marketing. He loves the marketing that. end of it. And so he has said that one of the major tasks for the Heritage Foundation in the months and years to come 
is going to the grassroots and communicating our ideas more broadly, uh, dispersing them out and talking with people, not only here in Washington, still keeping our concern with what's going on here in Congress, but reaching out to governors, reaching out to state capitals, reaching out to state legislators in a very direct way. So that's, uh, we're still there leading the way, if you will, in this very important field. I want to ask one other <clears throat> question, and then I want to go to the audience. Um, the culture, not just the politics, but the culture is something, um, the importance of the family, family life, is something that Heritage <clears throat> has always gotten. And my sense is ev even, has been even more proactive, increasingly, in striving to protect. Um, why, has that always been a part, important part of the vision? <clears throat> Um, and am I right to say even increasingly so? Well, I, <coughs> I, th I think that's an uh, <coughs> interesting question because uh, no. <laughs> in the beginning, um, Heritage was not involved in social issues. And even, even in the 90s, I want to say. Right. Um, Ed Fulner made a deliberate decision in the 1970s and 1980s that Heritage would concentrate on economic issues national security and foreign policy issues. There were some very good organizations which were working on social issues. But along came the 1990s, and it was very clear, this was articulated by Pat Buchanan, among others, that we were in a culture war. And the board of trustees came to Ed Fulner and said, we have got to get more active in the culture war. If we lose that part of the war, we may lose the country. So he went out, hired uh, and brought on board Bill Bennett, former education secretary, to be a distinguished fellow. We published uh, indicators of leading uh, cultural indicators, index of leading cultural indicators, which became a bestseller, which turned into Bill Bennett's Book of Virtues, which some of you may use with your children and grandchildren. And we plunged into it to such an idea. I know Jennifer Marshall, are you still here somewhere? <clears throat> and Jennifer, with the um, center that she's doing, with the DeVos Center, is now there up to here and worrying about what's happening with the family, what's happening with children, what's happening with education. So that is a major, major part of it. And again, I think it's an indication of how Heritage will take a look at the current situation. What is it? What is the crisis? What needs to be done? Can we help to solve it? If so, we will jump in 100%, which is precisely what we've done with these cultural issues. And because of the resources that have been amassed here, it's, 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 a, it's a huge thing when Heritage decides to... Well, it is a huge thing, and we are a huge foundation. <laughs> uh, we have 600,000 uh, members who help to raise $80 million a year. We don't have a large uh, endowment like Brookings, so we have to go out and earn that 80 million every year for the most part. And here we have to give credit to the president immediately preceding Ed Fulner, a wonderful gentleman named Frank Walton. And it was he who in 1975, when he was the, the third president of, uh, of Heritage said, you know, we, we've got to broaden our financial base. We can't just depend upon Joe Coors, God bless him, and Richard, Ed Noble, Richard Noble, God bless him, and Richard Scaife, God bless him. We've got to broaden that base. Well, how do we do it? Through direct mail. So it was Frank Walton who initiated that, that approach that made it possible for Heritage to have the broadest financial base, membership base, of any think tank, not only in America, but in the world. And it gives us not only a financial independence, but an editorial independence. No one individual corporation foundation can tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. We can always say, we're not for sale. Um, with that, I'd like to take some questions while we still have time. Is there, you know, what's, there's a woman <coughs> with a microphone. A the microphone there. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for the wonderful presentation. My name is Julia Shaw, and I work for the Center for Principles and Politics. And yeah, I hear you. Oh, uh, my name is Julia Shaw, and I work for the Center for Principles and Politics. And thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I was wondering. You wrote a great piece on Slate about young marriage. 
Two people should get married early. <laughs> oh, thank you. What are you waiting for? I think was the title. Anyway, go ahead, oh, thank you. I, I would love to know, um, you, you commented briefly about how heritage had changed the think tank culture. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about heritage, how heritage has kind of changed liberals or changed the left. How, how has the presence of heritage changed how liberals respond to us and respond to conservatism? Great question. Well, again, <clears throat> this question of what, what if there were no heritage? Life would be so much easier for liberals if there were no heritage, <laughs> because they know we're there at all times, ready to come up with an answer, ready to come up with an analysis which, which will challenge a liberal proposition or and a liberal ready argument. And to help organize people. I mean, that's, yes. that's one thing right. that heritage right. plays a really important role in Washington doing and in the country. I mean, we know that uh, heritage makes a difference because at some point, let's say in the 1990s, of course, 1980s was a high point for heritage because of uh, Reagan. But again, what we were able to do in the 1990s with trying to get Bill Clinton to understand what real life was all about. So we stopped uh, Hillary Care. We brought about welfare reform. We helped to bring about contract with America. And liberals became more and more frustrated. They said, you know what we need? We need a think tank like Heritage. Well, it took them a while, but John Podesta, the chief of staff for Bill Clinton, started the Center for American Progress in the year 2003 and said openly, we are modeling us after Heritage. <clears throat> Ed Fulner's response was, well, yes, that's, that's very flattering, uh, John, but there's just one little difference between you and us we have the right ideas, you have the wrong ones. We've, we have made a difference, no question about it. Other questions? Okay. Must, must have more. Okay. Yeah. Genevieve. Mm. Lee, I know that you interviewed, I, I don't know how many people actually for the book, probably what, 30 some odd mm, interviews well, in total? 50 or 60. 50 or actually. 60, so double yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, and I know that in some cases you said you actually learned something. So you've been a, his, a historian of the conservative movement, but you even learned some things about Ed, for example, uh, that were stories that you didn't know as long as you've known him and you've been at Heritage. Can you share just <clears> maybe <throat> one or two that kind of show the personal side of, of Ed? Well, um, Ed Fulner is a big man, quite an imposing man, and has something of a, of a command about him. You know, he's a little bit intimidating, but actually, he's a softy. He really is a softy. And what I discovered was that he would constantly reach out and help people without being asked. Um, one of his closest friends was, uh, for years, is Belden Bell, who um, ran for, for Congress. They met on Capitol Hill. Belden went back to Indiana, ran for Congress, and lost by 0.04 tenths of 1%. You know, it was just that close. Well, the next morning, he was there in Indiana, depressed as all hell, frankly. You know, what should I have done? What could I have done? What's the future hold for me? I was really ready to, to give up. The phone rings, and it's Ed Fulner. And he said, Belden, come home. Come home. Come back to Washington, D.C. Work with me at the Republican Study Committee. This is where you belong. Don't be you know, ready to give up just because you lost this race. Belden came back served in a number of important positions in the Reagan administration, went on to be an ambassador, is now a member of the Heritage Board of Trustees, has made all kinds of contributions. Because Ed Fulner picked up, picked up the phone and said to a good friend, come home. When Dick Allen was railroaded, really, out of his position as the National Security Advisor to Ronald Reagan, and the media sharks were circling him, ready to be <clears throat> taking great chunks of his flesh out. Um, what did Ed Fulner do? 
he organized Friends of Dick Allen at a big luncheon at the Mayflower Hotel. And four or five hundred people came there and raised the flag and said, Dick, we're still behind you. And a year later, Ed Fulner started the Asian Studies Center. and Dick Allen was the first chairman of that. So unlike some conservatives, Ed Fulner does not leave the wounded on the battlefield. He reaches out, rescues them, brings them back, repairs them, fixes them up, and puts them back into the fray. The man of extraordinary charity, of willingness to help the other man. Extraordinary. And that, that, that spills <clears throat> over into the actual policy work, too. I mean, the people or policy is more than a cliche with, <clears throat> with, uh, with Ed Fulner, correct? I mean, that is at the heart of, because all too often when we, in media and politics, when we actually talk about real people, you know, we, it's to exploit them or to, to use them for your <clears throat> ends. It, all, all too often, it can become, it, it can certainly, it, because it, this becomes your work uh, and it's not the core of your existence anymore <clears throat> at some, some point um, when it becomes routinized or you're in a campaign or whatnot, um, that, that hasn't happened with Ed Fulner, has it? I mean, <clears throat> he insists on, 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 of course, he's no longer here, um, but was for those, those 36 years, and insisted on staying in touch. And let me give you an example. Each Monday morning, we had a meeting today at 8.30 on Monday morning called the Middle Management Meeting. And some 30 or 40 people, sometimes more than that, Middle Management of Heritage come together and talk about what they're doing briefly, brief reports, what's happening on the, the House, the Senate, what papers are coming out, what events are being held out. Uh, John Hibble talks about that and so forth. At the end of this meeting, talks takes about, an half, about an hour, uh, for the good of the order, what happens then? Ed Fulner, and this blew my mind the first time I saw him do it, Ed Fulner used to go around and by first name, recognize every person in that room and say, Joe, something, Billy, Agatha, Lucy, and right down around. He knew every single person's first name. And yet, he's still somebody who's concerned about having luncheons with prime ministers and presidents, is being concerned about, as he was this early this morning, what heritage you'd say about Margaret Thatcher. Um, a man who, in the best sense of the word, uh, was a hands-on president and just gave a personal touch to the operations of the Heritage Foundation. And that's something I get the sense in your book he got from his family. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Um, his, his faith was ter tremendously important to him, as, as I said earlier. And I have to tell one, one personal story um, partnerships, two, two, two great partnerships that, that enabled Ed Fulner to be successful and bring about and this to making Heritage a permanent Washington institution. Number one, Phil Truluck. That's the professional relationship, partnership. Phil Truluck came over from the Republican Study Committee to the Heritage Foundation in 1977. So, he has also been here for 36 years, and uh, praise the Lord, he's going to stick around, and uh, Jim DeMint has already made that clear. They have been this extraordinary partner, one being the outside, Mr. Outside, if you will, the CEO, and the other being the COO, and they work together in such a way that I think is really unique. Well, I know it's, I don't think I know, it is unique in Washington, D.C., <coughs> that these two men could work together, respecting each other, differing talents, differing abilities, but yet working together for the greater good. The other very special relationship, really even more important, is the personal one with his wife, Linda. Linda, an extraordinary woman, a partner in every sense of the word, who worked together with him, supported him, was with him every step of the way. And I have to say, Quick story, how they met. He was living here in Georgetown um, in a townhouse. 
with some, some uh, friends of his, colleagues of his. And he noticed this very beautiful girl <clears throat> moved in next door. Oh, who is that? Learned her name, <clears throat> began, well, you know, exchanging thoughts. And she was Linda from, from New York City, also happened to be Catholic, happened to ride a motorcycle to the hospital where she was working, which sort of intrigued him. This beautiful girl getting up, rum, 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 <laughs> off she went to D.C. General Hospital. And, but his room in the townhouse was at the top floor. Her room and her apartment was in the basement. So they got into the habit of Juliet in the basement <laughs> and Romeo at the top talking to each other late at night, maybe coming back after a date together. Wasn't that great and so forth. So I just love this Romeo and Juliet story, but slightly reversed as to where they should be. I, when I was reading that in the book, I thought if there was a conservative lifetime, they would make a movie out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody else have any questions? Can I interrupt you from the side? Uh, hint also about the relationship with uh, former Attorney General Ed Meese. When Mr. Meese first came, I believe <clears throat> there were surprisingly some people that supported Heritage that really found that a little questionable. Although Dr. Fulner in his famous line always said two Eds are better than one. And then I would like you to hit on one other aspect that I always find intriguing and that is Ed Fulner and his relationship with someone's political career beginning in Washington, that of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> yes, right. Well again, I think that we see with the selection of bringing on board uh, Ed Meese, who had been the Attorney General, um, of being able to see, now this is somebody who's going to fit in beautifully with us. Because we needed to develop at Heritage much more of a legal uh, end of, of analysis and policy making. And coming out of that and making sure that Ed would be here, we made him the Ronald Reagan Distinguished Fellow. So here we had the connection with Ronald Reagan, but also the idea of having somebody who could really build a legal presence and a legal analysis of issues here. Uh, at the other end of, so Ed Meese is over here, slightly different area on the political spectrum is uh, Hillary Rodham. Uh, this is back when Ed Fulner was working with Mel Laird and the, the Republican uh, conference in the House um, and was in charge of interns. So he got a call one day from, from Mel Laird from Wisconsin. He said, well, I got a call from a, friend, a fellow colleague of, of, of mine from Illinois. And he says, you must find a place for this young woman who wants to intern in Washington, D.C. And um, so you take care of that, Ed. And so Hillary Rodham showed up. Uh, she uh, supposedly had been a Goldwater girl in 1964. Um, we have tried to establish this as a hard fact uh, and have not yet been able to find her name on the roll. So maybe she was a Goldwater girl. But by, by a couple of years later, which is when we're talking about 66 or 67, um, she came to work for Ed, Ed Fulner as an intern uh, from um, Wellesley. Is it Wellesley? Yeah. Wellesley, I think, yeah. Uh, he said, well, summing her up, she was uh, very ambitious, very bright, and not very republic. <laughs> so he was, he was Hillary Rodham's first boss in Washington, <laughs> D.C. He did his best with her, but obviously he needed a little more time to be able to get her to think the right way. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, you mentioned earlier in your talk about some of the leaders at Heritage before Ed Fulner was, was <coughs> in charge. And it, it, people always associate <coughs> Ed Fulner and Heritage as one and the same. Could you tell us a little bit more about some of the early leaders like Paul Weirich and the others? No, I'd love to talk about, about Paul Weirich because it really was, Paul was a, a, a staffer for a senator and Ed, Ed Fulner was a staffer for a House uh, 
member, congressman uh, from Illinois, and, uh, Phil, Phil Crane. And the two of them got to know each other as rising young stars, conservative stars here in Washington, D.C. They would have breakfast together, talk about how they could work together, what they could do to advance conservative ideas. And it was coming out of these breakfast meetings which they had, which they realized that what was needed was a think tank, which would produce uh, concise, concise, timely, and reliable information. And so it happened that in, in, the, in the course of events that Paul was more available to become the first president of Heritage, which he did, although Ed was on the board. And, and yet, there was a little problem there with the beginnings of Heritage. It had no name. Joe Coors put up $250,000 to get it going. One of the reasons being, he said, because it had a wonderful business plan. And that's what Heritage has always tried to be, as much like as possible, as a business. But it needed a name. And Joe Coors kept pressing Paul Weirich for a name, a name, a name. Got to have one so we can incorporate. And finally, he called up one day and he said, you will have one for me tomorrow by noon. Bang. Paul, trying to sleep, coming up with names, Commonwealth Foundation, don't like that. What about this and what about that? Woke up the next morning, went doing his usual morning walk with his dog, his wonderful wife, Joyce. Still no name. Time's running out. Get me to the church on time. No, no. And uh, <laughs> looked over, and there on the lawn was a sign that said, Coming soon, Heritage Townhouses. That's it. Eureka, Heritage. That's the name. Ran back to the house, called up Joe Coors. Here's the name, Heritage Foundation. Lawyers checked it out, and that, in fact, is where we got our name. Now, and if you look at where Paul Warwick lived, which is in Northern Virginia, in Annandale, I think we can say that Heritage really got its name through urban sprawl <laughs> brought together by the growth of the federal government. <laughs> I, I was thinking it was either divine inspiration or the power of a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> well, exit, name? that's, the, that's <clears throat> the name of the, 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 the new think tank in Washington. And are we out of time? One, one, one more question one more there, question. sir. Yes. It's not so much a question <coughs> as, as an observation, because I worked at Heritage from 79 to 81. So when you're talking about those days, and you also, I think, write in your book, you know, that was before, before <coughs> computers, before <laughs> tweeting, before Facebook. <laughs> it was also before direct deposit. Uh. What I can remember is every Friday, every other Friday, Ed would have the paycheck and he'd walk it around to each of us and he would give us our paycheck. Oh, and thank you because that was a, a custom which, which started and which Heritage has kept. And it's, it's uh, donuts and paychecks, no. or is it paychecks and donuts? Paychecks and donuts. I, I, guess I, I remember when I was an intern getting a little you know, car fare fee. He, I, he would hand me the check. So every, every other week it's called uh, uh, paychecks and donuts, and people come together. But it's not just, see, this is so smart of, of, of Ed and of Heritage, it's not just to get the paycheck. Of course, now it's all, as you say, electronically deposited. And, but of course, the wonderful donuts and coffee, but to network, to catch up, to schmooze and so forth, coming out of those informal meetings have been a lot of marvelous ideas. And it builds the feeling uh, of solidarity, of family. And I think that's really been a core reason for heritage success. It's not just a, quote, foundation. It's not just even a business, but it is a family that we are dedicated to the movement, dedicated to a better America, and dedicated always to these, these right ideas which inspire us uh, and keep us going in good times and bad. But the good times are coming, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the good times are coming. As long as real people s still work together as a team and know what they're about. Right. right. Work together. <clears throat> well, well, thank, thank you, you, Catherine, and thank you, Lee. Thank you. Thank you. I interrupted the discussion to run to an office because you kept talking about brief and concise. <clears throat>
That was the mandate for leadership, <laughs> brief and concise, in 1980, just in case some of you have not ever seen one. For the record, this does not take a year to read. <laughs> and we do have copies, of course, of the book available outside. Lee will be available out there as well if you'd like to have it personalized by him. And of course, in another aspect of heritage where it's often been said, ruefully, that we are a catering service masquerading as a think tank. We do have <laughs> lunches for you as well. So thank you again for your kind attention. <clears throat> thank you, John.